Great. Thank you, Professor Mitra. Uh, it's Alicia Main speaking. I'm a professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, it's my honor to be uh, leading session two on industry and innovation. Uh, and I believe, uh, first, I want to thank um, Professor Mitra and the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology for uh, putting together this very uh, thought-provoking and uh, interdisciplinary session, uh, bringing people together from uh, various elements of academia, from various disciplines, as well as uh, industry uh, and um, uh, uh, government, and, uh, and I'm sure there's regulatory bodies here too, to come together internationally to try to enable nanotechnology solutions for a sustainable future. The industry and innovation uh, session is going to build on many of the themes that we've heard in this fascinating first session on nanotechnology and society policy and science diplomacy, and uh, particularly the multi-stakeholder approach to try to get breakthrough nanotechnology solutions uh, out of the lab and uh, to the point uh, made by um, Professor Stephen McGuire uh, to get them to full industrial scale solutions. So next, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. James Rabot, who is a professor in the School of Physics at the University of Sydney uh, and a Sydney Nano member. And he's going to speak to us today about towards practical quantum sensors, research and industry collaboration. Uh, Dr. Rabot. Thanks, Alicia, very much. Um, and I just want to also thank Sushanta for, for including me in this lineup of uh, speakers and um, Isabella and Lisa for what what looked like a logistical tour de force, getting all these times lined up and so on. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do something that I've never attempted before in this talk. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in half of the talk on the technology and the science of quantum sensing, what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And in the second part, I'm going to focus on the how and, and specifically on the translation and industry engagement that we're, that we're involved in right now at this moment. In fact, um, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to my industry partner's uh, location and we're having a, a, a workshop meeting, planned meeting. I also, before getting into that, let me just, um, I also want to say I'm a proud Waterloo graduate from 1997. Um, and I think the people around Sydney, where I'm, I am currently, are getting sick of hearing this. But after graduating, I had the opportunity to work in uh, Donna Strickland's lab for about a year, helping her set up her, her laser lab, and um, and uh, was so excited when she when she won the Nobel Prize um, uh, for Physics not long ago. So just a few little points. My connection to Waterloo is deep and strong, and I'm so happy to be part of this uh, this uh, workshop. So I'm going to talk about uh, nitrogen vacancy centers and diamond for quantum sensing. Um, I don't know if you, I hope you can see my mouse. I'm going to move it around. Uh, it's useful if you can, but probably not highly necessary. Starting from the left side, um, diamond materials and synthesis of diamond in the lab has been uh, around successfully since around the 50s. General Electric demonstrated the ability to, to make high pressure, high temperature diamond. And that, that field has advanced dramatically over the last 60 years. Um, in the 80s in particular, there was a lot of, a, a fairly big push to get, to try to make diamond based semiconductors. That it was taking advantage of the, uh, the high thermal conductivity of diamond. Now that really never took off. It's still being researched, but there's issues and problems with the materials. Nevertheless, some, that technology has, uh, the, the growth technology has um, advanced. The diamond at the top is, is a micro scale crystal that I grew in a chemical vapor deposition reactor um, under a scanning electron microscope image. Below that is uh, diamond from the, the world leading uh, company, Element 6, who are a subsidiary of De Beers Diamond, and they grow by CBD, the best quality diamond um, available. And, and they can dial up parameters. They can, they can add different defects into the diamond to, to make it useful for certain applications. Um, and then below that is uh, a scanning electron microscope 
image of nanoscale diamonds. Uh, these ones look like they're around 50 to 100 nanometers growing again by me in a, in a diamond reactor. So what I'm going to focus in on and, and describe is um, one of the one of the defects that can incorporate into diamond. And there's many. There's a whole book on the different uh, things that can incorporate and make the diamond colorful in some instances. Nitrogen can incorporate basically replacing a carbon atom. You can get a nitrogen atom incorporating into the diamond lattice. And if it's adjacent to a vacancy site, which basically connects with the, the nitrogen, it forms an optically active defect center, a fluorescent center. And so if I if I illuminate that that center with a laser, a green laser, I'll get fluorescence that looks like on the right of the screen. It's a broad emission centered at about six, 680 nanometers. Um, so that in itself is, okay, there's lots of things that fluoresce. Uh, what's the big deal? Well, it comes down to diamond being the host crystal. And, and you can think of this, in this case, one nitrogen atom in this picture, I, this cartoon I have here, one nitrogen atom trapped in a very rigid crystalline structure. And when we talk about quantum applications, sometimes we liken it to being putting an atom in a cryostat, in a, in a you know, a, a, a millikelvin fridge and cooling it down. What happens with, dime, with a, a nitrogen atom or other defects in diamond is that they're effectively isolated from their environment, and that opens up a, a whole bunch of opportunities to to study it and to to use it. And I'll and I'll describe a little bit of that in uh, in a second. Just a, a couple of more pictures to to, to describe this fluorescence uh, part. The the vials that you see on the top uh, on the right hand side is a sort of yellowish diamond. That's that's diamond. Those are diamond crystals that have nitrogen incorporated, um, and they have a yellow uh, uh, yellow look just under room lights. Now, if you irradiate and create irradiate that diamond, so pummel it basically with ions or electrons and knock carbons out of their lattice point, you create vacancies. And if you heat heat up the diamond, then those vacancies will migrate to a low energy position adjacent to the nitrogen and form NV centers. And these are NV rich diamonds that, that are kind of rose colored. And, and we get uh, naturally occurring diamonds in Western Australia that, that are quite valuable, that are rose colored. Now, if we take these big diamonds on a, on a relative scale, these big microcrystals at the top and scale it down to nanometers, tens of nanometers, we can use these fluorescent crystals as um, fluor like, like fluorophores or quantum dots. And the advantages of diamond in comparison to those competing um, biolabels is that diamond is carbon. It's considered to be biocompatible. It's photostable. It's trapped. These color centers are trapped in the in the lattice. They will never extinguish. They don't blink. They don't bleach. Whereas um, others do, and the surface of the diamond you can you can think of it as a blank canvas to attach what you want to it. Uh, I work with a, a colleague here uh, in Sydney at Macquarie University who functionalizes the sur surface of diamond in order to attach them to molecules and so on. I'm not going to talk a, a lot about this. In fact, I'm not going to talk any more at all about this topic. Um, one thing, though, to just to mention. Uh, we together started up a company a few years ago called Lucy Gem to to pursue the pursue the area of um, nano diamonds for biomedical imaging. Okay, what I want to talk about, and this is going to be fairly rapid fire. I'm going to try to get across the key points. Um, diamond uh, the the NV center has um, this optically active. Uh, it is optically active. So it, basically the energy level structure looks like what you see in the bottom right corner. And it has an electron spin that is polarizable. So what that means is that um, in the ground state, there's a zero and plus or minus one spin states. Um, now I'm considering a single nitrogen vacancy center here. So it has a zero and a plus or minus one spin state. When I excite this center with a laser, the transition is spin preserving, so it goes from zero to zero. And don't worry if, if this is not your area, I'm not going to get 
too into detail on this. So it goes, it excites from zero to zero. And basically what you get under green illumination is a cycling of excitation and emission. And, and you get a lot of photons coming out in fluorescence, that red, broad fluorescence spectrum that I showed previously. If you're exciting, so it's a, it's a bright, you can think of the zero as a your kind of bright state. Now, if I excite from this plus or minus one, which by the way, under no magnetic field, that plus or minus one is, is considered to be degenerate, as in uh, they're equal in energy. So you think, think of that as one state. If I excite from this state, what you have preferentially happening is a, um, rather than an optical emission, so rather than fluorescence coming out, you get a, a decay over into this metastable singlet A state, which is long lived. So it sits, so, so population moves over here, and then eventually it comes back down to zero. Now, the implication, and this is what we harness, this is what enables us to use NV centers for so many different things, is that um, we can, we essentially have uh, a lens into what state the NV center is in because we know whether it's bright or whether it's dark. So the way that works is um, you, you take, so this, this energy separation between zero and one is about 2.8 gigahertz. So what we do in the lab is we take uh, an RF source and we take a wire. This is in, in many cases, simply a thin wire coming up to the diamond. We're illuminating the diamond, the NV centers near that, that wire. And we're getting fluorescence coming out in, in a cycling way. Now, as I sweep the energy of that, of that RF source through resonance with this um, uh, ground state zero to one transition, looking at this, this um, image at the top, top right, basically as I sweep it along at 2.8 gigahertz, all of a sudden I'm pushing population up into the one plus minus one, and I'm getting effectively a dark luminescence. This, this yellow is a, is a measure of the average fluorescence coming out. So basically this is telling me that at, at a 2.8 gigahertz, I'm all of a sudden I'm populating the plus one state. And then you move along and it becomes that brighter level. So it's kind of like on and off. Zero is on, one is off. Now, if I um, take this a step further and apply a magnetic field to my diamond, and literally, again, this is simple. You take a magnet, a fridge magnet, and bring it close to the diamond, and, and you see this happening. So what, what I'm doing now is I've got the magnet. These two levels actually start to split. It's called a, a Zeeman splitting. So the energy... As the magnetic field gets bigger, the energy difference, the plus goes up and the minus goes down. So instead of getting, when you sweep your RF field, instead of getting a single peak at 2.8, you start to see two peaks separating as the magnetic field gets stronger. Okay, what do we have? We have, we have a window into what state it's in, but we also now have, based on the separation of those two peaks, we know uh, what the strength of the magnetic field is. So that's really cool, and that's very powerful to, to harness. I should just just say here that um, quantum computing with NV centers and diamond is, is deeply studied. Where we're at right now in that is material science challenges. But the, the, what I just covered on this slide is essentially the basis for a qubit. Um, one NV center has a zero and a, and a one state, that's a two-level quantum system. Now, you can actually couple them, couple NV centers and, and manipulate them using the RF field using, um, and using the laser. So all the ingredients are there to, to make a quantum computer. Um, that's not the focus of what I'm doing, but it, we're harnessing that magnetic field sensitivity. So let me transition into this, this the, the, firstly, the, the motivation and then how we do it. This is what the lab looks like. We have, and, and many people who do um, work in optics labs are very familiar with this mess. Um, it's mirrors, lenses, uh, detectors, <laughs> the optical fibers, a bit of everything all packed into this table. And it works really well. We can measure uh, a magnetic field in, in diamond. Um, kind of demonstrating that it's possible and, and doing deep dives into different areas. This is, is um, not 
something that you could take out into the field. This is not a commercializable situation right here. Um, but there's a real motivation to make it so. Um, there's a lot of interest, for instance, in, in using the diamond and these centers as a magnetic um, sensor for navigation using um, the Earth's crust magnetic fields, which are fairly stable. Um, for things like magnetic anomaly detection, where you're looking for large metallic objects in the water uh, underground, these are largely defense applications. Um, mining and exploration. Um, if you could miniaturize and take what's on that table and miniaturize it down to single blocks, like what you see on the right of the screen, you can imagine something like magneto encephalography and imaging of the brain um, and other medical applications. So the point, without talking too much about the applications, diamond and V-centers operate at room temperature. They are so would be superior to most of the other available technologies um, out there that measure magnetic field. They're small and compact. So there's a real motivation to actually turn this lab bench into something that is portable, something that is um, robust, like you see on the right of the screen there. That's fake. That's actually something completely different. And uh, but it looks it's it's a device. Um, and so I mentioned earlier that this is very real for us right now. And, and what I wanted to convey in this, in this talk is. I mean, there's the specific, and that is quantum sensing is really interesting. There's a lot of potential. And then there's the general of how do you take something that looks like that in a lab or whatever case and turn it into a commercial product? How, there's so many barriers, and, and Steve McGuire, I know, um, uh, covered a bit of that. And we, we have the, we're fortunate to have him here that we can sit down and have a coffee and talk about the challenges and how to, how to uh, uh, deal with them. So just to, to look at my experience here on the on the left, look at a research lab. What what typically is happening? Well, you get something that's kind of big, spread out. Um, this is not a scalable device. There's there's uh, individual mirrors. There's a huge expense in uh, and redundancy built into an experiment like this. Um, they're temperamental. Like <laughs> typically, this kind of experiment is. Um, you know, run by a senior PhD student or postdoc. The, the professor is not allowed to pass a certain line in the lab because they'll, they'll break something typically. Um, so it's a temperamental thing and there's an expert who runs it. Now, the advantage is that it's broad, it's flexible. It can, it can look at, I mean, this system can look at many different materials. It can use different wavelengths. So it's perfect for research. It's ideal. But if we want to move that into the into the commercial world, we need to think of it differently. And 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 in fact, it's it's more than just identifying what, in my experience, it's more than just identifying what is needed. It's it's actually getting into the head of people in industry and understanding their world does not think in the way that we are on the left side of the screen. They, 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 that does not compute for them, sort of thing. So let's look at on on the right side. A company. So this company that I'm visiting this afternoon, this is how they think. You know, it's it's like it's um, things are small, miniaturized. They there's definitely scalability is always on the the radar. How do we make something scalable, uh, cost effective, robust that it can be taken out into the field, for instance? The application typically isn't broad and 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 um, flexible. It's focused on a specific problem to solve and and the the device is built to, to meet those needs. And there's also the added thing of you know manufacturing and supply chain considerations which they bring bring in. Um, so so kind of I mean the purpose of this slide is to say, well here's the situation. We both have something to offer. Um, how do you do, how do you now do it? What what what's the next step? So again I'm gonna tell you exactly my situation. This is what we're doing. I think there's some value and some general things that can be taken from this. On the left side of this, so we're trying to build a quantum sensor. We want to take what's on the lab bench and turn it into a, a device. In fact, we have money to do that, um, which kicks off in December, and we have two years to do it. So I've put together a team 
uh, initially to get this funding. And on the left side is the is myself and and my side of the um, project, and that is quantum science, material science. We understand how to build uh, an NV center magnetometer. We've done it. We understand um, the signals, the parameters, and so on. Um, so that's good. That's a start. We I also have got two engineers involved from different universities, and the engineering team have expertise in um, a lot of the electronics and RF signal control. So on, on our side, we use boxes, off-the-shelf electronics boxes that can do many things. They're clunky, and we plug them in. What the engineering team understand how to do is to, to narrow it down and say, okay, what exactly do we need in electronics, and can we design a chip for that? And so that is that is also what we're doing is designing a chip to meet all the electronics control and readout needs. Um, the team also has more applied experience in, in prototyping and interacting with industry. So that's great. I mean, in fact, the, my colleague Omid Kavahe is also in the Sydney Nano Institute. I don't know if he's listening today, but um, he's uh, my close collaborator on this. So in that process, we we talked, we interacted, we shared papers. Um, and then literally there was a, a conversation saying, well, hang on, we actually do some work with with a, a company in Sydney and they do X, Y, Z. And then we thought, well, wait, we should talk to them and see if they want to get involved in what we're doing. And we did. Um, and they are involved and they are interested. Um, yes. OK, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Sushanta, sorry. Uh, uh, that this is the, the last slide. Um, basically, um, they're they're very much interested in in working with us, and they have a lot. They can answer a lot of the challenges that that we have. And then the last thing is is the end user. We also have a partner who who um, will actually use the the devices and give us feedback on how that works. So this this virtuous circle is really where I wanted to land. And um, uh, with that, I'll I'll wrap up. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we probably don't have time for questions given the the, the time. But um, thank you. That was a fantastic uh, talk, Professor uh, Rebo. And um, I, I think that there will be questions for you that have come into the chat that can be sent directly to you. Um, and if we have a chance at the end of the session, maybe we'll get to some of them then. Um, and uh, I'm going to load my screen. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, so let me take this opportunity to introduce uh, the last speaker for the session two, which is Professor Alisa Main. She's a professor of innovation entrepreneurship from Simon Fraser University, which is in, in the west coast of Canada. So Professor Main, please. The talk I'm going to give today is uh, mirroring some of the themes that we've heard. Um, from both the uh, excellent um, uh, policy session earlier on and uh, the industry session now, some of the themes of how we get uh, breakthrough uh, nanomaterials solutions and uh, tackle large problems in climate uh, you know, change and also with um, uh, biomedical applications and, uh, and, and to many global uh, society. The perspective that I'm going to take on this is also uh, multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder, but specifically it's the things that we can do while still in the lab um, by professors, by universities, by innovation policy, uh, by PhD students, by postdoc researchers. And I'm going to focus on uh, three papers, uh, the findings from three papers that are uh, looking at um, nanotechnology enabled and advanced materials and nanotechnology enabled solutions and commercialization and what can be done even before a firm is formed and when the technology is still in the lab to give that technology a much greater chance of being implemented at full scale industrially successfully. So I want to make a shout out to my co-authors, uh, Professor John Thomas at the University of Fraser Valley in, in, uh, in um, BC, Canada, uh, Dr. Martin Blimo at University of Technology Sydney in Australia, and uh, Dr. Cynthia, Cynthia Shipman at the National Research Centre uh, in Canada. She's a, an a industrial technology um, officer, but also um, a, a multidisciplinary individual. And 
the two other papers, again, are about the ways to make strategic decisions early in order to help raise financing and, uh, and taking the perspective of a venture capitalist firm and of industry partners, again, when you're still in the lab, what you can do to help the notoriously uh, um, difficult commercialization process uh, facing many breakthrough nanomaterial inventions. And interestingly, this, uh, this paper, Accelerating Advanced Materials Commercialization, I co-authored with a venture capitalist, uh, Dr. Pranesh Siegelpal, who is also uh, a PhD materials engineer uh, and a partner in uh, uh, Pangea Ventures, which uh, invests in nanomaterials and advanced materials. So I came from the theory and he came from the practice. So the opportunity, what's the opportunity? Well, it is uh, the fact that in universities and in government research labs uh, and uh, nanomaterials researchers um, drawing on a number of disciplines are able to discover and enable new materials that have enormous uh, improvements in performance attributes. We've heard about one of them just now. Um, or, or enable new attributes or very substantial reductions in cost. So it's, it's radical invention that could enable radical innovation. They also uh, can take impact across several areas of the economy, several sectors of the economy. So this makes it a general purpose technology. Um, with all of the value creation that that entails, the potential value creation. However, in terms of the challenges, um, there's a whole literature in the social sciences and in the innovation and entrepreneurship literature around the distinction between technology ventures and science-based ventures. With a science-based venture being uh, an entity that uh, is contributing to the science while also trying to uh, you know, create money and, and commercialize uh, uh, inventions. And uh, they face much higher uncertainty, both technology and market, over extended periods of time. And uh, you can't, may not be able to see it with the different things open in your screen, but that the blue circle is the money that's spent during R&D. And the red circle is the money that's spent with commercialization and scale up, so pilot plant facilities. Uh, if you're in the biomedical field or a new therapeutic, that's clinical trials. And critically, this money is spent, or large portions of it are spent, before the uncertainty is resolved. And so it's a challenging commercialization space, hence some of the charts we saw earlier today. Uh, this, the paper that I, I showed earlier, the Nature Materials paper, uh, explores this uh, in terms of some numbers behind it and talking about these uh, uncertainties, the sources of technology uncertainty, the sources of market uncertainty, and how to mitigate them. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at the time frames, the biomedical, advanced materials, nanomaterials, technologies face much greater time scales from invention uh, to, to innovation, so commercial uh, implementation, uh, and far higher commercialization costs with this uncertainty. So uh, in this paper, we explore some of the strategies uh, to reduce those. Um, and again, this is the, the definition of science-based ventures. Gary Pisano um, has written a fair bit about this. He's at the Harvard Business School and has written a fair bit about this in the context of the biotechnology sector. Uh, and I've explored it more deeply in the nanotech sector. So one way, along with our research, one way that we thought uh, that various, um, and, and, and integrated with our research, we thought one way that various um, countries and universities and ecosystems could try to help uh, address these commercialization challenges was to help those people who are creating the inventions have a lens that helps them to make the early stage decisions while still in the lab and before they've gone out uh, into the business world to, or their idea has been, uh, has been put into the business world, to try to give their technology and their ventures, if they're starting it, or their industrial collaborations, the best chances uh, of success. And currently, there is some things being done in this. Um, I was delighted to hear about the initiatives going on in Australia at the moment, um, uh, multidisciplinary and, and the customized embedding of social sciences researchers into uh, nanotechnology labs. 
Um, in the United States, since about, I think, 2011, the, the National Science Foundation has funded a program called I-Corps. Uh, I believe it was Super Subresh when he was the uh, head of the uh, events, uh, of NSF who started this, feeling that there had to be better ways to, um, to take science-funded research and uh, to be able to, um, you know, have it address opportunities with a better chance. And it's a good program, and it started to, to come into Canada, too, through Dalhousie and now Ryerson in something they're calling Lab to Market. But essentially, it's market discovery. So it's one stage beyond uh, the lab itself. And it's, it's, it's often not taking advantage of the full potential of the invention. And that's because it's based on lean startup principles, which were, you know, which were um, uh, written about and, uh, and defined within the IT sector and the technology sector. So their degree of technology uncertainty was, was far lower, and their time frames were far shorter. So uh, this, these programs are not good enough for high technology uncertainty. And uh, for nanotechnology-enabled solutions in particular, but for all science-based ventures, we need more tools for managing this uncertainty. Uh, for very early pre-formation of a venture, uh, technology market exploration and matching, and strategy around IP and financing early before a company is formed. And that's because coming out of universities and research labs, particularly in areas like nanotechnology, uh, there, is a, there is the potential to create new industries or to participate in and see the transition of existing industries. And this is not uh, the things that uh, traditional accelerators are built for. They're, they're built for opportunity recognition, which is a whole other stream of processes. Uh, and uh, so often traditional accelerators will squash some of the best potential of things that are coming out of university research labs when they're breakthrough invention. So uh, we studied this extensively, uh, nanotechnology solutions um, in the biomed space, in the clean tech space, and looked at exemplars. And we found that there are pre-formation entrepreneurial capabilities that scientists can develop that will help them endow a venture um, for a better chance of success. So one of them is technology market matching that's happening in the lab. It's a sensing and shaping capability. It's actually shaping the opportunity, and it's often doing it uh, right at the project formulation stage when it's done well. So that could be taking an existing technology and marking it and, 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 and adapting it to fit an uh, emerging market opportunity, or it could be trying to develop a technology to meet a specific future need, um, uh, but very early on in the project. The other uh, three are seizing or capturing value entrepreneurial capabilities. They can also be done pre-formation of the venture. They're claiming and protecting the invention through IP strategy. They're attracting and mentoring a founding team. And they're the strategic timing of patenting, uh, sometimes of publishing, uh, and of firm formation. So these happen. They start with a scientist entrepreneur and his or her lab members. And these capabilities start with technology market matching. They go on to claiming and protecting the invention, attracting and mentoring a founding team, and the timing of firm formation. But they happen within an industry ecosystem. Uh, within a university, uh, has its own uh, technology licensing office and its own uh, or tech transfer office and its own IP policy. There's all of the incentives we've heard before about uh, um, you know, about journal uh, publications and the incentives of scientists. And there are, is the community of experienced executives and entrepreneurs that a university and the surrounding collaborators are able to, um, to mix the uh, academic scientists with. Venture capitalists, if, you're, if you need venture capital, uh, they also are going to have a lot to say uh, about the, the founding team and the team as it builds up and uh, around uh, uh, the timing of your events pre and post from formation. So the kind of capabilities, just to sum that section up, uh, the, the kind of capabilities that, uh, that scientists um, 
can have that will enable uh, nanotechnology solutions to um, be have a better chance in helping us create a sustainable future are first um, those that enable a well-endowed science-based university spinoff. And we call that, from the scientist's perspective, the scientist entrepreneur path. So typically it's a grad student, a PhD student, a postdoc um, who has decided that they're not going to go on the tenure track path or, or there's not an opportunity for them to go on a tenure track path. And we want to help them to found what we call a well-endowed science-based university spinoff, something with a good chance of getting financing and commercializing the invention. But a second path and an equally important path to our innovation ecosystems is someone who can be a champion of innovation, somebody who uh, knows what keeps the CEO awake at night in their small and medium-sized company, uh, who can lead new product development uh, efforts, whether in a, a small company or a multinational company, and who can help reach back into universities uh, to help breakthrough inventions come out of the lab. And finally, a path that may be those who do continue on to tenure track um, and tenured university jobs or are already in those, um, and yet they want to have more impactful translational research with a better chance of success. And that could be measured both in the types of translational research grants that they get, uh, but certainly then in the number of, um, you know, patients that they positively impact or the amount that they're able to uh, mitigate climate change. So we're, we have a program called Invention to Innovation, uh, which is doing, uh, which is teaching these capabilities. Um, recently, we have uh, taken the program in partnership with MyTax, a Canadian uh, in organization uh, embedded into 60 universities across Canada that brings industry and academia closer together. Um, we have uh, innovation skills that we're teaching to postdocs and PhD students. Uh, and some of our alumni from the program that we started uh, at Simon Fraser University and, uh, and now, now going to other universities um, include uh, scientist entrepreneurs in nanomaterials fields, um, uh, both in energy and in uh, biomedical um, fields, and others that are champions of innovation and translational scientists. I'd be happy to talk to anyone more about this um, if they desire uh, after the fact. And, and critically, it's because before students take a program like this or have uh, development of capabilities like this, they don't think that they need business training and they think if they make a startup, they'll just team up with someone who understands business. But what they realize after their mindset is, is developed in terms of things that are important to investors and the things that are important to uh, industry partners and uh, the types of skills that are inherent in, uh, in endowing, well endow uh, endowing university spinoffs for success, that actually their science changes, the, the targets they have in the lab change. And uh, they realize that um, uh, they're able to impact in, in bigger ways, uh, and they have more career opportunities as well. So my message uh, to this um, uh, symposium is simply, in order to enable uh, nanotechnology solutions for a sustainable fit future, yes, consider interdisciplinary pr perspectives, multi-stakeholder perspectives, and consider that uh, one of our most valuable resources, our PhD students and our postdoctoral fellows in science and engineering, uh, are, are being underutilized in our innovation ecosystems to help us uh, solve the challenges of our day. Um, with breakthrough research and um, with a little bit of some of the programs we're hearing about here today uh, and some of those interdisciplinary perspectives, we can uh, make much greater use of those resources uh, to create a future we'd all like to see.